I want to welcome everybody to the webinar this today, uh, Aligning Your Programs with Federal Funding. This is a NACO and ESRI webinar on the federal funding itself. Uh, today, uh, this is a series of four webinars. Uh, today, we're going to be covering housing, economic development, and planning. In the next coming weeks, we'll have uh, something on health and human services, transportation and transit, and broadband as well. Um, the opportunity for new money uh, does not come around very often, and it's uh, an exciting place, but it also has its problems as well. And one of the biggest problems is the misunderstanding of what the programs are about and how you can access this money and how can you use it. And that's the reason for today's webinar, especially to bring in NACO and uh, Michael Matthews one of NACO's experts on the subject. Uh, I'm going to get out of the way quickly. Uh, so Ma Ma uh, Michael, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Matthews, and I'm the Associate Legislative Director at the National Association of Counties, um, who handles the Community Economic and Workforce Development Portfolio. Um, thank you for having me today, and, and I really look forward to, uh, over the next 20 to 30 minutes, um, addressing a few different topics as they relate to the American Rescue Plan, or ARP for short. Um, first, I will discuss what's included in the American Rescue Plan, uh, specifically as it relates to housing, economic development, and planning activities. Um, to that end, I will not be covering in depth the state and local recovery fund within ARPA, uh, mainly because NACO already has a plethora of resources that do a really deep dive into virtually everything you'd ever need to know about it. Um, but since it's a major provision for counties in the American Rescue Plan, I thought it was important to briefly highlight um, the program to help paint the larger picture of what resources are available to counties uh, for these specific uses. Um, after, going into, after going into the various programs, I'll also provide a few examples of how some counties are spending or planning to spend the money um, through a few of the programs I'll be talking about. And finally, before turning it, turning it back over to Keith for his portion of the presentation, I will address some of the frequently asked questions about a handful of the larger programs within the ARP. Um, I will remain very high level given how large the American Rescue Plan is. Um, I mean, you could do an entire series on just the frequently asked questions of, of the various programs. Um, like I previously mentioned when talking about the various uh, funding streams within the ARP, um, that counties can utilize for economic development, housing, and planning, I would be remiss not to discuss the state and local recovery fund. Um, again, I won't spend a lot of time on it since this webinar today is supposed to be on the other funding streams, but again, I thought it was important to highlight given its many eligible uses. Um, further, by better, better understanding how the recovery fund can be used, it will empower you to make spending decisions that best fit the communities you serve and also help ensure that you spend the resources in the most efficient manner. So the American Rescue Plan provided $350 billion, a little over $350 billion through the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund or the Recovery Fund um, for eligible state, local, territorial, and tribal governments to respond to the COVID-19 emergency and to also help bring back jobs. Um, this fund was established to help turn the tide of the pandemic and address the economic fallout um, and lay the foundation for a strong and equitable recovery. Of the over $350 billion, about $65 billion was allocated directly to counties themselves. Um, within this allocation, there are five primary ways outside of the lost revenue allowance that counties may invest the funds. Um, these include supporting the public health response, replace public sector revenue loss, premium pay for essential workers, water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, and finally, the most important in the context of the conversation we're having today, addressing the negative economic impacts. Um, the interim final rule, which establishes the various uh, uses of funds that I just mentioned, along with other criteria, provide broad flexibilities to counties to help those disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially to the addressing the negative economic impacts category. Additionally, the interim rule provides even greater flexibility for qualified census tracts and other communities, households, and businesses that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Um, to make it easier to visualize, I'll break down some of the eligible uses of funds under the addressing the economic impacts category into the following subcategories. Um, and they are assistance to households, small business and nonprofit support, aid to impacted industries, assistance to unemployed workers, 
and services for qualified census tracts and other disproportionately impacted communities. So under the assistance to household subcategory, some, some example uses of funds include uh, rent, mortgage, or utility assistance, counseling and legal aid to prevent eviction or homelessness, home repairs, weatherization, or other needs, internet access or digital literacy assistance, and job training related to a worker's occupation or occupation or level of training impacted by COVID. Um, for the next category, for the small business and nonprofit support, counties can use the funds for uh, loans or grants to mitigate, mitigate financial hardship, such as declines in revenues or impacts of periods of business closure. Um, for example, by supporting payroll and, and benefit costs, costs to re retain employees, um, mortgage, rent or utility costs, and other operating costs. Um, another way it can be used is for loans, grants, or in-kind assistance to implement COVID-19 prevention and mitigation tactics, such as uh, physical plant changes to enable social distancing, enhance cleaning efforts, barriers or partitions, or COVID-19 vaccination and testing, or contact tracing programs. Additionally, it can be used for technical assistance, counseling, or other services to assist with business planning needs. Um, next, the next category or subcategory is impacted industries. Um, funds may be used to aid tourism, travel, hospitality, and other impacted industries that responds to the negative economic impacts of the COVID-19 public health emergency, um, such as implementing COVID-19 mitigation and infection prevention measures to enable safe resumption, consultation with infection prevention professionals to develop safe reopening plans, activities that support safe reopening of businesses in the tourism, travel, and hospitality industries, and business districts that were closed during the COVID-19 public health emergency, and also planned expansion or upgrade of tourism, travel, and hospitality facilities that were delayed due to the pandemic. Um, for assistance to unemployed workers, some services include job training to accelerate rehiring of unemployed uh, workers, workers unemployed due to the pandemic or the resulting recession, um, workers who are already unemployed when the pandemic began and remain so uh, and remain so due to the negative economic impacts of the pandemic, and also individuals who want and are available for work, including those who have looked for work sometime in the past 12 months or who are uh, employed part-time but who want and are available for full-time work. Um, and lastly, services for qualified census tracts and other disproportionately impacted communities. Uh, the main highlight or example for uses of funds under this provision includes um, investments in housing and neighborhoods. Um, funds under this kind of subcategory may be used to assist households or populations facing negative economic impacts due to COVID-19, such as um, services to address homelessness, such as supportive housing, and to improve access to stable, affordable housing among unhoused individuals. Affordable housing development to increase supply of affordable, high quality living units and housing vouchers, residential counseling, or housing navigation assistance to facilitate household moves, uh, household moving to neighborhoods with high levels of economic opportunity and mobility for low income residents um, to also help residents increase their economic opportunity and reduce concentrated areas of low economic opportunity. Um, the cover period for the recovery funds uh, under the state and local uh, fiscal re uh, recovery fund extends from March 3rd, 2021 and ends on December 20 or December 31st, 2024. But there are a few important distinctions and exceptions to the cover period. Um, the funds must be obligated by December 31st, 2024, and the funds need to be expended with all work performed and completed by December 31st, 2026. Um, next, I will go over the housing provisions within the American Rescue Plan um, that counties are able to utilize. Um, so under the American Rescue Plan, which was enacted back in mid-March, um, it included nearly $43 billion in mandatory funding for housing-related programs um, that were intended to really assist people experiencing homelessness, housing, or housing instability. Um, this funding is obviously in addition to the funding in the state and local recovery fund um, that can also be used for certain housing activities. Um, and this additional housing assistance um, couldn't have come at a more appropriate time. Uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau data from early July, there was an estimated 11.4 million renters that reported having fallen behind in their rental payments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, further, it was estimated that over 250 counties nationwide had more than 20% of their renter population behind on rent. Um, so to help address this crisis, the American Rescue Plan provided an additional $21.6 billion 
um, for the U.S. Treasury Department's Emergency Rental Assistance Program, or ERA for short, um, which was established in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. Um, the funding is really for state, county, and municipal governments with populations over 200,000 residents. And it's really to assist families struggling uh, to make rental and utility payments. Um, for counties with populations below 200,000 residents, states may also allocate um, funding directly to them or administer the program at the state level for these jurisdictions. Um, among other requirements, states and localities must use the bulk of the funds for financial assistance. Um, which is defined to include rental assistance and utility assistance, including the payment of arrearages. Um, remaining funds may also be used for housing stability services, like case management and other supports to help families retain uh, their housing and administrative expenses. Um, so for a renter to be eligible for assistance under this program, uh, they must have an income below 80% of the area median income, or AMI for short, qualify for unemployment insurance or have experienced financial hardship during or due, whether it's directly or indirectly to COVID-19 and also have a risk of homelessness. Um, the law also established obligation and expenditure deadlines and imposed various other reporting requirements um, on the treasury secretary. Within the statutory requirements and any additional guidance established by treasury, um, state and localities have a lot of flexibility in designing their own rental assistance programs. Um, the ability of states and localities to structure their programs obviously uh, differ um, in a lot of ways, um, uh, whether it's geographically or other kind of um, pressure points within their specific communities. Um, similarly, um, there may be a degree of variability to which existing resources, both for ERA and other funds, are adequate to meet demand for rental assistance and the speed at which grantees are able to disperse assistance. Um, later on in the presentation, I'll highlight a county, a couple counties who have been doing an exceptional job at administering the program. Um, but the more counties I speak to um, who've had success, there's a few common themes that really have appeared. Um, most, if not all, have incorporated at least a, hand, a handful of the following um, themes. And there are partnerships and program implementation, culturally and linguistically competent outreach, intentional landlord engagement, partnerships with broader eviction diversion programs, specifically engaging the courts, collaboration with local utility companies, <clears throat> making the application process simple and user-friendly, using fact-specific proxies to establish applicant income, automation supporting application prioritization, and also data-driven program strategies. Um, next, the American Rescue Plan also provided an additional $5 billion in a new emergency housing vouchers program. Um, so through the new emergency housing vouchers program, um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development is providing an additional 70,000 housing choice vouchers to local public housing authorities um, in order to assist individuals and families who are homeless, at, at risk of homelessness, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking or human trafficking, or who are recently homeless or have a high risk of housing instability. Um, funds may also be used to cover related administrative expenses. Um, additionally, the vouchers are to be distributed to local public housing authorities as determined by the Secretary of HUD, um, but unlike regular housing choice vouchers, after fiscal year 2023, they cannot be reissued with, uh, when families leave the program. Um, and lastly, the third housing specific program created under the American Rescue Plan where counties are directly eligible for funding is the Homelessness Assistance and Supportive Services Program. Um, this program, which received $5 billion, is appropriated through HUD's home program and is also distributed via the home formula, um, but with obvious certain changes to home program requirements that would otherwise apply. Um, funds under this program are primarily to benefit individuals and families who are homeless, again, at risk of homelessness and fleeing domestic violence. Um, eligible activities under this program include, um, they're also the, they're similar to the general, it's generally applicable to eligible uses under the home program. And again, like I mentioned, with certain additional activities, including supporting services. Um, ARPA also specifies that grantees may use funds to acquire non congregate shelter units uh, with the option to convert them into permanent housing. 
Some examples of eligible activities under the HOME program include uh, tenant-based rental assistance, housing rehabilitation, assistance to home buyers, new construction of housing, and also site acquisition, site improvements, demolition, relocation, and other necessary and reasonable activities related to the development of non-luxury affordable housing. Um, equally as important as knowing what the funds can be used for is also knowing what they can't be used for. Um, some examples of uh, what they may not be used for are public housing development, public housing operating costs, or for Section 8 tenant-based assistance, nor may they be, nor may they be used for non-federal matching contributions for other federal programs, or for operating subsidies uh, for rental housing, or for activities under the Low Income Housing Preservation Act. Um, as for who's eligible, home funds are designed for states, cities, and urban counties. Um, and communities that do not qualify under an individual allocation uh, under the formula can also join with one or more neighboring localities in a legally binding consortium whose members combined allocation would meet the threshold for direct funding. Um, so other localities may participate in HOME by applying for program funds made available by the state. Um, so switching gears a little bit, I'll now discuss the economic development activities um, that are supported under uh, the American Rescue Plan. Um, specifically, ARPA provided $3 billion of grant funding to the Economic Development Ag uh, Administration, or EDA, to help communities with recovery efforts in response to economic injury caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this economic adjustment assistance is now available to eligible state and local stakeholders through six new programs administered by the um, Economic Development Ad Administration. So according to the A EDA, these programs will support bottom-up economic development that's focused on advancing equity, creating good paying jobs, helping workers to develop in-demand uh, in skills, building economic resiliency, and also accelerating the economic recovery for the industries and communities that were hit hardest by the co uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, so now I'll briefly go over the six programs, each of which have a different um, investment criteria and priorities, um, starting with the Build Back Better regional challenge. So the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, which was the largest of the programs at uh, $1 billion, is designed as a two-phase competition to one, help regions develop transformational economic development strategies, and also fund the implementation of those strategies that will create and grow regional um, growth clusters. Such, activity, or such efforts will help regional economies recover from the pandemic and build economic diversity and resiliency to mitigate impacts of future economic disasters. So in phase one, EDA will provide technical assistance grants to approximately 50 or 60 coalitions um, through a lead institution. Um, these coalitions will be considered the finalists and the grants will be used by the finalists to prepare more detailed applications for transformational projects that benefit their respected uh, geographic regions and are aligned around a holistic approach to building and scaling a strategic industry. Um, so in phase two, EDA will award each of the 20 or 30 finalist coalitions um, 25 to $75 million and potentially up to $100 million uh, to fund the collection of projects they identified. Uh, the projects will be funded through uh, grants to coalition members, eligible applicants aside from counties, um, include special government districts, state governments, 501c3s, and institutions of higher education. Um, unfortunately, the closing date for applications for phase one of this popular project was October 19th, um, which means that the selection process to receive this funding is already underway and the program is no longer accepting new applications. Um, so of the 529 applications received, counties were really well represented. Um, and I'll go into a little more detail later on about some of the applications um, during my next section of the presentation when I discuss county examples of the various funding streams. So the next program under uh, the EDA is the Good Jobs Challenge, which was designed to help Americans back, uh, to get Americans back to work by developing and strengthening regional systems to develop and execute sectoral partnerships um, that will lead to well-paying jobs. The goal of regional workforce training systems is obviously to create and implement effective employer-driven training programs that will connect the existing and emerging, and emerging skills uh, that are needed for employers with uh, workers and, and will help workers find and keep quality jobs and advance along their chosen career path. 
Um, these regional workforce training systems and sectoral partnerships funded under the Good Jobs Challenge, um, according to the EDA, should connect employers in an industry with key regional stakeholders, including state and local government entities, economic development organizations, workforce development boards, employer-facing organizations, education and training providers, community-based organizations, uh, worker serving, serving organizations, and or also labor unions. Um, the system or partnership should be led by a system lead entity or backbone organization, as they call it, serving as the intermediary that is the convening power in the region and has the capacity to coordinate all the necessary stakeholders. Uh, EDA also encourages uh, systems and partnerships to address populations with labor market barriers, such as persons with disabilities, at-risk youth, individuals in recovery, individuals with past criminal records, including justice impacted and re-entry participants, and also veteran populations. Um, they plan on making approximately 25 to 50 awards under this program, and uh, they're scaling the awards as appropriate to the proposed geographic, industry, and worker role coverage of a given regional system. Um, applications for this program are not due until January 26, 2022. The third ARPA program offered through the EDA is the Economic Adjustment Assistance Program. Um, this program makes $500 million in economic adjustment assistance grants available to eligible applicants, um, which again also include county governments. Um, the EAA program is EDA's most flexible program actually, and grants made under this, pro uh, under this program um, are designed to help communities plan, build, innovate, and put people back to work through construction or non-construction projects that are really designed to meet local needs. So a wide range of technical planning, workforce development, entrepreneurship, and uh, public works and infrastructure projects are eligible for funding under this program. Um, the EDA encourages application submissions based on long-term, regionally oriented, coordinated, and collaborative economic development or redevelopment strategies that really foster economic growth and resiliency. Um, this includes plans aimed at building stronger regional economic links between urban centers and rural areas. Um, they expect to fund approximately 300 projects um, with costs between half a million dollars up to five million dollars. Um, although projects could receive funding above or below these thresholds, they're not hard numbers on either side. Um, they haven't posted a deadline for submitting an application for funding um, and applications are being reviewed on a rolling basis. Um, but the EDA does recommend submitting an application as soon as possible and no later than March 31st, 2022 to be considered for funding. So the fourth program which counties um, aren't eligible for is the Indigenous Communities Program, which received $100 million. Um, this program is designed to support the needs of tribal governments and indigenous uh, communities and to also help them develop and execute economic development projects that they need to recover from the pandemic and build economies for the future. So moving on to the fifth program is the Travel, Tourism, and Outdoor Recreation Program, uh, which was appropriated at $750 million. So this program is designed to help accelerate the recovery of communities um, that really rely on travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation activities. So of the 750 million, um, 510 went to state tourism grants, which are non-competitive grants that were allocated to help states quickly invest in marketing, infrastructure, workforce, and other projects to rejuvenate safe leisure business and international travel. Um, counties, although weren't eligible for the, the first tranche under the state, tourism grants are eligible for the remaining $240 million that come in the form of competitive grants. Um, these are really designed to help communities that have been hit hardest by challenges facing the travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation sectors, um, and really to invest in infrastructure, workforce, and other projects to support the recovery of the industry and the economic resiliency of the community in the future. Again, EDA suggests applications under the program should be submitted no later than March 15th, and they're also being reviewed on a rolling basis, so the sooner the better. And the final program under the uh, Economic Development Administration um, is the, the Statewide Planning Research and Networks Program. So of the $90 million that were appropriated, $59 million was appropriated for statewide planning grants. Um, although counties aren't direct grantees, they do benefit from this funding indirectly. Um, example projects that can be used under this funding include integrating local and regional plans to develop a statewide plan. 
Um, but the other $31 million will go into research and networks, uh, the research and networks portion of the program, which counties can apply for the funds. So under the research grants, EDA anticipates awards of uh, two, up 200,000 to 600,000, each for projects that support research and evaluation into the economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and they're specifically interested in real-time research into the American Rescue Plans programs, especially EDA's other programs like the Good Jobs Challenge, the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, the Indigenous Communities Program, and the Travel, Tourism, and Outdoor Recreation Program. As for the network grants, EDA anticipates awarding uh, grants between two and $6 million for each project that addresses one of the following two objectives. Uh, one is to provide technical assistance to new EDA grantees in one or more of the following three cohorts. Um, and that's the Build Back Better Regional Challenge applicants, Good Jobs Challenge applicants, and the Coal Community Commitment grantees. Um, and the, the other objective is to develop networks or communities of practice within programs or topic areas that, are, that connect existing and future EDA grantees in one or more grantee community, such as its economic development districts, tribal partners, university centers, revolving loan fund grantees, build to scale grantees, and others. Um, so now that I've gone through the various housing and economic development funding opportunities under the American Rescue Plan, I'll briefly highlight some county examples. Um, under the State and Local Recovery Fund, the, uh, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, and also the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. Um, starting with a few examples of how counties of various sizes are using their state and local recovery fund uh, for economic development and housing initiatives. I'm um, starting with Saline County, Kansas. Um, in this county, which is located in the central part of the state, it's home to about 54,000 people. Um, they received $5.2 million in their first tranche and have identified five strategic priorities to address with the state and local recovery funds. Um, the top three were business and nonprofit recovery, housing and economic and workforce development. Um, so starting with their business and nonprofit recovery, they've already taken actions through partnering with the Selena Chamber Foundation to distribute grants um, from, a from the ARP uh, to the Selena Airport Authority for an additional nonstop flight destination to support their travel and tourism related businesses that were severely impacted by the pandemic. Their spending plan also recommends uh, that support for local businesses, again, uh, take the form of grants. So two phases of recovery grants would be provided um, for revenue to maintain and restore operations um, and would be based in part of uh, the only amount of reopening costs. Um, the second priority for funding is stabilizing and supporting local travel, arts and hospitality nonprofits affected by the pandemic. So the, uh, these recovery grants would provide revenue to maintain and restore operations and will be based in part on needs, again, related to effective reopening. Um, for their housing plans, a priority for their funding um, that they uh, mentioned would be in their application would be procuring land and or partnering to develop additional housing units, which includes but is not limited to housing to individuals with low or moderate incomes, rehabilitating existing housing, and providing funding for emergency repairs to low and uh, to low income homeowners. Further, the initial investments may be allocated to already in progress housing developments that are going on within the county, like the redevelopment of properties within designated low income census tracts to expand the availability of uh, rental units. Um, for the other example uh, that I have for the state and local recovery fund is Fort Bend County, Texas. Um, this is located in the southeast portion of the state, as you can see on the picture. Um, and it's home to about 822,000 residents. So within their plan, they've allocated about $25 million to various housing and economic development programs under the negative economic impacts use of funds. Um, they, all they allocated about $10 million to a small business grant program where they'll make grants uh, with the average size of about $12,500 to businesses that are between 25,000 and 5 million in annual revenue um, and it's designed to help them continue operations, increase employment opportunities, and ensure they have the resources to remain open in a safe and socially distant environment. They also allocated $1.2 million to create a business accelerator program, which is a regimented 12-course program designed to provide businesses with the tools to accelerate their businesses 
um, their business growth and also resurge with a stronger business than before the pandemic. Um, so more specifically, they're seeking to recruit 100 Fort Bend County based businesses and double their annual revenue within three years. Um, the program also provides a $5,000 grant award as an incentive to complete the program and realize the benefits of the program. As for their housing programs, they're investing uh, more into the emergency rental and utility assistance program and also into a mortgage assistance program to help reduce foreclosure and delinquencies to mortgage payments to prevent uh, homelessness. So moving on to the emergency rental assistance program examples, um, I'll highlight a few counties which have been doing a great job at administering the program and, and really getting resources to the people who need it most within their communities. Um, like I previously mentioned when discussing the common themes of, themes of successful programs, I'll highlight um, a handful of programs based on a few of the different themes. So one program that has done well at utilizing partnerships and program implementation is Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Uh, they've intentionally partnered with a pre-existing network of homelessness and eviction prevention activities. Um, outreach and program implementation uh, within Montgomery County occur through six community-based nonprofit organizations that are spread geographically throughout the county. Um, these organizations um, that specialize in provide these include organizations, sorry, that specialize in providing culturally and linguistically competent services to the hardest-hit areas of the county. Um, further, these organizations maintain a common information system and use the local housing crisis responses coordinated entry system, which connects applicants with a range of relevant services and programs. The next county uh, that has done a terrific job at implementing culturally and linguistically uh, competent outreach is Richland County, South Carolina. Um, and they really found strong partnership opportunities with the county's 13 libraries that are spread throughout the, uh, the community. In addition to providing convenient centers of support to residents, the library system also has a pre-existing relationship with local uh, social workers. Uh, this network has really provided the ERA program within Richland County um, administrators an opportunity to train the existing network professionals to educate residents about the ERA program. This effort has really led to an increased accessibility of professional and holistic support um, for households that are really in need of the ERA services while also providing applicants um, free online access and other resources. And finally, uh, I'll pivot to a few of the Build Back Better regional challenge examples. Although uh, currently there isn't much detail on the submitted applications, I still thought it was important to highlight a few of the uh, programs that stuck out to me. Um, one being uh, Pima County, Arizona, with their Pima Takes Flight, building an aeronautical and technical workforce, uh, Contra Costa County, California, with their advanced manufacturing as an engine for equity and wealth building along the northern waterfront of Contra Costa County, and also Luna County, New Mexico, with their transforming southern New Mexico's agriculture, manufacturing, and logistics and energy regional cluster. So switching gears one last time, um, I'm going to transition a bit to discuss some of the common misconceptions and address some of the most frequently asked questions when it comes to a handful of the ARP programs that I previously discussed. Um, since every program has different requirements, deadlines, agencies they report to, et cetera, I figured it would be more beneficial to answer one or two of the most frequently asked questions for each of the following programs instead of trying to do one a one size fits all frequently asked questions uh, portion. So the, the programs that I'll, I'll be talking about are the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, the Emergency Housing Vouchers Program, uh, the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, and also the Good Jobs Challenge. So again, starting with the State and Local uh, Fiscal Recovery Fund, the first frequently asked question is, what are the reporting requirements? Um, so there are a number of different reporting requirements, including the interim reports, which counties were required to submit one interim report, uh, which will include the county's expenditures by category at the summary level. Um, the, interim, the interim report um, will cover spending or did cover spending um, from the date the county receives recovery funds to July 31st, 2021. Um, with the interim report being due um, August 31st, 2021. Counties also have to submit quarterly project and expenditure reports, which also include financial data, 
information on contracts and subawards that are over $50,000, and other information regarding utilization of funds. Um, these reports are similar to the CARES Act Coronavirus Relief Fund reports, and the first report covered um, spending from the date, again, that county received the funds to September 30th, 2021, and they were due on August 31st, 2021, um, but these are quarterly reports, so the next one will be coming up soon. Uh, lastly, counties also need to submit recovery plan performance reports. Uh, these are annual reports which include descriptions of projects funded and information on performance indicators and objectives of each award. Um, the initial recovery plan covered activity from the date, again, the county received the, the funds to July 31st, 2021. Um, local governments with less than 250,000 residents were actually not required to develop uh, recovery plan performance reports, and these reports were due on August 31st, 2021. And the second most frequently asked question for the recovery fund is, are counties required to remit interest that's earned on recovery fund payments by, uh, made by Treasury? So the answer is no. Uh, recovery fund payments made by Treasury to local governments are not subject to the requirement of maintaining balances in an interest-bearing account and remit payments to Treasury. Um, the counties are able to, to retain any interest made off of um, that fund. Um, so moving on, I'll highlight two frequently asked questions under the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, the first one is, what steps can ERA grantees take to prevent evictions for non-payment of rent? So Treasury really strongly encourages grantees to develop partnerships with courts um, in their jurisdiction that adjudicate evictions for non-payment of rent to help prevent evictions and develop eviction diversion programs. So for example, grantees should consider um, providing information to judges, magistrates, court clerks, and other relevant court officials about the availability of assistance under ERA programs and housing stability services. Um, also, they should work with eviction courts to provide information about assistance under the ERA programs to tenants and landlords as early in the adjudication process as possible. Um, and they also recommend engaging uh, providers of legal services and other housing stability services to assist households against um, which an eviction action for non-payment of rent has been filed. Um, the second big question for the emergency rental assistance is, may a grantee provide ERA funds to another entity for the purpose of making payments more rapidly? Um, and the answer of that is yes. Um, to speed the delivery of assistance, grantees may enter in a written agreement with a nonprofit organization um, to establish a payment fund for the sole purpose of delivering assistance using ERA funds while a household's application remains in process. So a grantee may use uh, such, process, such a process if um, it's reserved for situations in which expedi uh, expedited payment could reasonably be viewed as necessary to prevent an eviction or loss of utility services um, that precludes employing the grantee's standard application and payment procedures on a timely basis. Also, if the nonprofit organization has the requisite financial capacity to manage the ERA funds, such as being a certified community development financial institution or CDFI. Um, the nonprofit organization also deposits and maintains the ERA funds in a separate account that is not commingled with other funds. The grantee also receives all required application and eligibility documentation within six months. Uh, the nonprofit organization agrees in writing um, to return any grantee to return to the grantee any assistance that the household was ineligible for or for which the required documentation is not received within six months. And also any funds not used by the nonprofit organization are ultimately returned to the grantee. Uh, so the next is the emergency housing vouchers program. And the first question is, does the public housing authorities uh, pull households from its current wait list for the emergency housing vouchers? Um, and the answer is no. Public housing authorities must only accept referrals for these vouchers from the continuum of care system or other partner referral agencies. Um, however, the public housing authorities must inform families on the housing choice voucher waiting list of the availability of the emergency housing vouchers at a minimum. Um, and the second question is, are the vouchers available for individuals or just families? So as long as they meet the eligibility criteria, they are available for both individuals and families. All right, now moving to the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. And the first question here is, are previous or active EDA grantees, including grantees with active CARES Act projects, 
eligible for this program? Um, EDA has answered that frequently asked question, uh, yes. Applicants that are current recipients of EDA awards, including CARES Act funding, are generally eligible to apply for funding under the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. Um, proposed projects, uh, proposed project activities and outcomes from prior EDA awards must be distinct and separate from the project submitted under the regional challenge. So put differently, awards made under this program cannot fund project costs that are charged to another federal funding. Um, and the next question is, must a project be, must projects be included in the application be located in a distressed area? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, however, applicants should indicate how the project will address economic uh, distress in the proposed region, as well as how the benefits of the project will share equitably across all affected communities within the project. Um, and finally is the good jobs challenge. Uh, the first question here is, are regional workforce training systems the same as the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act or WIOA systems? And the quick answer is no. Um, the systems may include WIOA systems or their component organizations, but, uh, but these regional workforce training systems are not limited to WIOA systems and may not always include a workforce development board as a partner. Um, other key partners may include employers, educational institutions, training providers, community-based organizations, labor unions, and employer-serving organizations. And the final FAQ for the day is, uh, do the activities proposed under the Good Jobs Challenge have to be aligned with a comprehensive economic development strategy or SEDS? Um, so yes, each project funded under the Good Jobs Challenge must be consistent with the current comprehensive economic development strategy or equivalent EDA accepted regional development, economic development strategy for the region or region served by the proposed project. So for a quick refresher, um, the SEDS is a strategy-driven plan for regional economic development, typically prepared by an EDA-designated economic development district organization um, to, to guide capacity building efforts that best serve economic development in the region. Um, these documents for consideration as SEDS equivalent can also include various regional economic development plans or a combination of plans, um, including but not limited to regional comprehensive plans regional resiliency plans, or re, uh, recovery plans. Uh, further, each application for the Good Jobs Challenge should include their project narrative, should include within their project narrative a discussion of how the collection of proposed component projects as a whole will support the economic development needs and objectives outlined in the applicable SIDS. Um, so before turning it back over to Keith, uh, for his portion of the presentation, I wanted to include my contact information in case you had any follow-up questions. I know it was a lot of information, and I really appreciate you guys bearing bearing with me through it all. Uh, and with that, Keith, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. Yeah, there, there's a lot to cover, and and as you mentioned, you kind of skimmed the surface. There's not enough uh, time in an hour to go over everything uh, here. So, so again, my name is Keith Cook. I am the uh, industry manager at Esri for planning and community development. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we can actually implement some of the projects that uh, that Michael was referring to that have funding mechanisms available to them. So uh, I won't go over all of this again. Uh, Michael's already hit a lot of this, but I think the key thing to, to know is that planning departments across the country, economic development offices, housing directors, um, had to put projects on hold either because of funding issues or because of COVID, uh, not being able to be in their offices, put a lot of stuff on maintenance mode or a combination of both. And the bottom line is that if funding was your issue, um, this may sound like I'm oversimplifying it, but really um, that's no longer an issue, either through the direct allocation uh, that your county has received or through the myriad of options that you have through um, uh, through federal agencies that uh, have a, an unprecedented uh, level of funding at this time. So as you're prioritizing projects, you can't do everything at once, obviously. You, you also have staff constraints and so forth to deal with. Um, GIS is going to be an essential tool that you're going to need to have to be able to not only prioritize these projects, but also to implement them, track them, and monitor them uh, down the road. So if you've been to any of our GIS conferences, the user conference, regional user group meetings and so forth, you have probably seen this slide at some point because we talk about this being a framework for GIS, but 
I use it because selfishly, I think it's also a framework for planning as well. So when a county planning department receives a, um, a plat to review or a site plan or a proposed redevelopment, they've got to manage that data. They've got to be able to measure things like setbacks and so forth. Uh, they've got to be able to map and visualize it. They need to be able to analyze uh, a development. Like, is it, you know, what's the impact going to be with shadow, with um, a line of sight and so forth? And then be able to model what that impact is going to be. How many people are we adding with this proposed development? What's the impact on traffic, uh, on jobs, on uh, utilities, on our infrastructure and so forth? And then we need to be able to actually get down to the the nuts and bolts of it, being able to plan and design uh, our specific developments, um, and then be able to make those decisions and take action on them. And so the good news is that uh, planners using GIS, economic developers, uh, housing directors, this isn't new. And especially over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen this emergence of what we call this web GIS pattern, which means that you have very focused and powerful applications that run on the web or and or on mobile devices um, that don't require you to have GIS software on your machine. So what this also means is that the planning experts don't also have to be GIS experts, right? They can actually use some very focused tools to help them analyze location. And location is gonna be a pivotal point, uh, a, a pivotal component and facet to any project that you're undertaking that that Michael went through, through that whole list that Michael went through, if you're looking at economic redevelopment, um, at affordable housing and so forth, location, is going to be involved in all of that. And so that's where GIS comes into play. So as I mentioned, you no longer have to be a GIS expert to be able to use some GIS tools. And so um, most planners, economic developers, housing directors are doing this through uh, very focused, uh, powerful applications. Um, so uh, either on the web or through mobile applications. So again, things that, uh, allow access to data that they need access to, again, without being um, the owners necessarily of that data or being required to edit that data. They have permission to be able to view it. It can be part of their application that can perform analysis on it um, and be able to help make data-driven decisions from that. And so we're seeing that being done through maps and dashboards. You see this dashboard here at the center of your screen. It you may recognize that and I've seen it on the news over the last couple of years. That's the dashboard from Johns Hopkins about um, COVID cases throughout the world. It's actually had over 2 trillion views. Um, and then of course we see ArcGIS story maps in this. This has been a, a favorite tool of planners now for years because we say all the time, Planners always have a story to tell. It could be the, the eight items that are coming up before the planning commission meeting, or it could be about a rewrite of the comprehensive plan or uh, of a proposed affordable housing or economic development uh, related activity. And story maps are a web-based way to be able to, to tell those stories. So as we go through this process, as you're going through the process of understanding, okay, these are the projects that we need to take on. Here's where GIS can kind of plug in and really help you to be able to prioritize those projects and implement them as well. We talk about this all the time, that understanding precedes action. We have to be able to understand what's going on within our neighborhoods. Um, and so on, within the Esri platform, this involves ArcGIS Business Analyst web app. Uh, your county may also know it as ArcGIS Community Analyst, which is a very similar project. But this provides, this is a web-based tool, it's an add-on to ArcGIS online, um, but it allows access to over 2,000 variables uh, of demographic information, socioeconomic content, businesses, uh, business information, jobs, spending behavior, and so forth, so that we can do everything from a demographic map that shows uh, a correlation or a bivariate map of housing affordability index with uh, median household income. We can establish a service area for a proposed office park or industrial park. Not only who are the people that we are serving that are within the service area, but what about employees? How many employees can effectively or efficiently get here? Um, or how many are close to a transit stop and so forth? Um, and then we can also generate this uh, detailed business data to be able to identify things like food deserts in our neighborhoods, um, and then be able to take this information, output it to a report, to an infographic, 
to be able to get a better understanding of where the needs are within our neighborhoods, right? So understanding precedes action. Um, one of the important things also is being able to leverage business intelligence from some mission critical business systems within your organization. And uh, being a former planner, I always gravitate back to permitting because that's usually a system that, that pretty much every size city and county uh, has in common. They're using that as their system of record for development within their organization. But a lot of times there are people that need access to the data that's held in the permitting system that may not have access to it directly. And that may be a licensing issue or maybe a, a legacy system that doesn't have the analysis tools that are easy to use. So within the Esri platform, we use ArcGIS Insights to be able to generate um, spatially focused business intelligence from our data. So the what you see here on the left is actually um, a workbook I created, and all I did was took I simply took a spreadsheet from Montgomery County, Maryland's uh, open data site that had uh, showed commercial permitting data since 2010, dragged and dropped it into Insights, and that's it. And then it parsed I parsed out uh, my use codes, which you can see here in a tree map. Um, the uh, permit status, whether it's open, closed, uh, finalized, stop work is on it. And I can see trends over time as well and by location. So I can see within a specific county commissioner's district, the, the trends over time in terms of what types of commercial developments have occurred and what, uh, what gaps there are in services. Right? So it's a way to be able to take a system of record, in this case permitting, and be able to extract more value from it as well. And then we can also leverage ArcGIS Solutions, which are a free component of, within ArcGIS Online to um, empower planners and economic developers to take on very specific workflows like uh, blight remediation, uh, being able to uh, track neighborhood stabilization, track uh, uh, problems from the public, do public notification tasks and so forth. Um, and these are all free open source applications uh, that your, your team would have access to. We Again, we have to look at the big picture uh, a great deal within GIS now, which is really, for me, it's it's transformative because this is really how GIS has evolved from much of the tactical approach now to much more of the strategic side. And so we have a free resource at Esri called uh, Esri Maps for Public Policy. The URL is in the bottom right-hand corner there. And it's a way to be able to access uh, really a ton of information. You can see a, a pre-made map that's already here, uh, households who spend more than 30% of their income on housing, which again is a red flag for HUD uh, and so forth, and, and differentiates between owners and renters. And so I can view these maps separately, um, or I can take them into uh, my ArcGIS platform if I so choose and be able to bring that data in as well. So it's a way to take a data-driven approach to the big picture view, to the policy development uh, view of where do we need affordable housing and why do we need it, being able to answer those questions. And throughout this, and sort of interwoven throughout this whole pol this process is civic inclusion. And this is really more of a, uh, an evolution of community engagement. So um, it's a way to take a, 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 a plethora of open data and then sort of fine tune it based on specific initiatives. So in Seattle, they're using a product called ArcGIS Hub to be able to promote their accessory dwelling unit policy, um, to be able to allow the public to see where they could build ADUs um, and be able to use pre-approved plans so that they're not spending hour upon hour in the, in the permitting office or in the planning office. They're able to do a lot of this just from within their own home and by extension, it's helping to alleviate some of the housing uh, shortage that's that's there in Seattle. And this uh, this example here at the top for Bucks County, Pennsylvania, I love this one uh, because what it's showing is the proposed subdivision and land developments, but not the not just those that are coming up for consideration next month in the planning commission meeting, but what's happened over the last four or five years. So that as you have newly elected officials, new developers, new residents that are coming in they're able to get up to speed very quickly about the history of, of development that's gone on in the area. And again, be able to see where there are gaps, needs for more affordable housing, uh, more equitable development and so forth. So we talked about policy development being the big picture, and then we can actually get down to the, the nuts and bolts, the tactical side of that through scenario planning and design. Again, within the Esri platform, 
This is done through ArcGIS Urban. And so what this allows us to do is play out different scenarios for developments at a block level, an entire project, an entire neighborhood, or just at a specific parcel. And within that, to be able to see the impact of a proposed development. So I can see if I'm building a mixed use development, how many people am I adding? How many um, jobs am I creating for office, retail, commercial? What's the impact going to be on traffic, on utilities, on CO2 emissions? What are the construction costs going to be? What are the financial benefits going to be um, over, over time? I can do that directly with, uh, within Urban and play out these different scenarios and compare them to see what would be our best decision going forward. So everything I've shown you so far is available over the web, but in addition to that, because it's part of the GIS platform, we can actually bring it into something like desktop and, and city engine and be able to make a photorealistic visual of our proposed development so that people can see what it would actually look like as well as measure the metrics for that development. So as we wrap up here, I wanna make sure that you're aware, as, as Richard mentioned at the beginning, this is part of a uh, part one of a four part series um, you can go to goesri.com slash uh, go slash stimulus funding uh, to learn more about this. You can see we've got one on health and human services on November 17th. On December 6th, we'll discuss transportation and transit and broadband on the 8th. Um, please believe me when I tell you we don't do these so I can look into the little blue light here and give you a presentation. We really need your feedback. We want to know what you what you want to see more of less of and so forth and we want to make sure that these webinars are, are really hitting the mark for you i really skimmed over the solutions uh, that we have um but uh, i wanted if you've got more questions about this you can go to esri.com planning for that and then my contact information is here below so uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions we're more than happy to help that's that's what we're here to do and uh, with a full two and a half minutes left, Richard, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and pass it back to you. All right, thank you, Keith. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we do have a question that I, that I think bears uh, asking. What are the roles of the individuals submitting these applications? Uh, are the awarded applications published anywhere where we can go find uh, applications that uh, may have won uh, or may look good and then be able to um, steal the good thoughts? Um, any any ideas on uh, where where these data might be held eventually, and how can we access some? I guess fundamentally, it's asking how do, how can we get assistance in in building up these applications for the feds? Michael, you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so for the state and local fiscal recovery fund, um, NACO has we have a resource hub where we've collected. Um, across the country, counties of all shapes, sizes, um, there, there are uh, plans for the fiscal recovery fund. Um, you can also select it by economic development or housing. Um, you can pick by county size, um, <coughs> geographic location and state, um, and it will bring up uh, a, a brief summary of it like I showed you on the one slide. But if you click learn more, which is below it, it'll take you to the actual application they submitted. Um, so there's Perfect. that for the other programs. If you go to the Department of Commerce or um, whatever the uh, agency is, they have a notice notice opportunity of or notice for funding opportunities. I um, mean, they usually post the submitted applications there. Um, it might not be the entire detail, but usually they post the winning applicants yeah. um, at the end. So and, that, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for winners. <laughs> Uh, well, I thank you. We we are short on time. Uh, we'll leave it at that. I, any questions that uh, come through the chat uh, that we don't get answered, we will follow back with the attendees. Uh, but with that, I thank you. Um, thank you for your time. There are, as Keith had mentioned, there are three other uh, webinars coming up, uh, one on health, one on transportation, and one on broadband. So stay tuned, uh, find our resources on, on our webpage, and we will see you later. Thank you.